Status is everything. Feed that back. You are, if you do not have the one up position, then you are servile. You're compliant. You're an order taker and not taking their orders, actually taking orders from the customer who's telling you, fill this thing out. Talk to my, my purchasing guy, all these other things. If you don't have the status and you're not a peer, then you're not in the one up position. And, and this is what has to happen if you want to be an expert, if you want to be consultative. And Warren, people, when I ask them what consultative means, they tell me two things. I ask really good questions, fine. And I don't use any high pressure tactics. Okay, fine again, not consultative. Consultative means I'm going to tell you how to run your business. I'm going to tell you how to make this decision because I have greater experience here than you making this decision. Not because I think I'm a higher status person as a human being. I'm sure that in, in many ways, the person I'm sitting across from are one up over me in a whole bunch of areas because I'm rather narrow. I'm rather narrow. So I don't have expertise in a whole bunch of areas, but where I do. You get on the phone with a hedge fund manager for whatever reason. And it's a guy manages $8 billion of capital. They're interested in some SaaS software to protect their crypto cybersecurity network. It just happens to be what you do. But you're really talking to a master of the universe. What are you doing inside Anthony's head to stay one up? Because that squashes most people listening to this. Okay, so here's what I'm doing in my head. Oren's a hedge fund manager. He knows a lot. He is a master of the universe, and I'm going to upgrade you and put you in a global 6,000. I think that's where you belong, Oren. You belong in something that's serious. You're a serious guy. So I'm going to put you in that plane, but I'm going to say he doesn't know beans from Brussels sprouts about solving this problem with his cryptocurrency hedge fund. So he needs me to come in and help him understand all of the things that he's going to have to factor into a decision about what the right solution looks like. And how am I going to win Oren's business? I'm going to teach him how to recognize all these factors, how to weigh them. So he has an understanding of this is why this needs to be more important for you. Even though this thing that somebody else told you was important is important for somebody else who doesn't have a hedge fund. And he let me explain to you why. So I'm going to be the one that's teaching and driving the conversation because even though you're a hedge fund manager, you're one down in this particular category. I'm one up when I need advice on what to do with my money. You're one up and I'm going to listen to you with uh, oh, wide open ears because I don't want to stay one down longer than I have to. So you're teaching them, but specifically my guess is you're teaching them how to buy. How to make a decision. I'll give you a, one of the easiest ways to try to convey this to people and it's a triangulation strategy. So a, a triangulation strategy means I'm going to leave the playing field. I'm not on the playing field anymore because that's where people who don't win play. They are on the field. I'm going to elevate myself. So now I'm sitting next to you as a hedge fund and I'm going to say, Oren, let me tell you what, there's four primary models that people use to deliver a SaaS solution that you might mistake for ours. There's four of them. Now I'm going to explain to you what happens when you pick choice number one, you're going to make a number of concessions around security that will probably not work for you right out of the gate. And then I'm going to explain the entire playing field so that the person understands I'm making a decision about a model. I'm making some concessions. And what's the concession that I'm going to ask you to make or in your hedge fund manager? I'm going to ask you to pay more than you would pay for any of these other solutions, because that's the one thing that's going to ensure that you don't have any problems in the future. All the other ones come with a different set of concessions that you're going to agree to, maybe not knowing, but now, because I just showed you, this is what's, what the world looks like. So I'm going to teach so that I'm the one that's actually making the decision by pointing to it in this particular way and teaching it. The reason I chose a hedge fund manager, I know these guys, I feel like you can't just be high status. You have to think about where they are and get way up there. So as yeah. social proof as they are, as big as they are, as tough as they are, you got to go there. There's not some, I feel like, what we could end up here with is younger kids going, I need to show some status. You have to think about where they are and get up there. Not too high, but not peer. too low below, right? Peer, you gotta at least be a peer, yeah.
And here's the thing, though. This is what young people do. They think it's the watch. And the watch basically just gives you away, like that you don't have status. Like, so they, you can't fake it. If you walk into the room and the presence isn't felt, you, you already don't have status. And, and how you walk into the room and how you greet people and your confidence, it's either going to give you away or it's going to prove that you are what you say you are. One of those two things. Whenever I deal with guys managing billions, the first thing I do is I just insult them. It's because when these guys come together, they, it, it'll oh. be very collegial. Hey, how you doing? You still fly? I've seen him. You still flying around in that tiny plane? The uh, Legacy 600 is not a small plane. Well, compared to, you know, Global Express, it is. Uh -huh, yeah, that's so funny. Hey, did you see Jim? And, and so they're quite testy and the f women too. They're quite testy with each other. And so I think you've got to figure out ways. So for me, if you want the easy shortcut to status, I love your opinion on this, is to say something that all your competitors and peers would not say because they go would be af af afraid to say they would be afraid, be afraid to say, to say. So, so generally after i work with uh, a ceo and i know them well enough enough so not perfect but i know them at dinner or something like that or my favorite question to ask is how long before people figure out you have no idea what the hell you're doing like how long is it going to take for people to figure this out and they all say the same thing there's, I'm surprised nobody said anything yet. There's not a CEO school. Like I showed up here, they made me the CEO and I've been trying to figure it out ever since. And this is when you get this kind of a conversation going with someone, they will let you know, there's a whole bunch of gaps. I'm trying to find people that can fill for me. I'm trying to find people that are smarter than me in these other areas, because I'm trying to run a whole company and I can't be an expert in everything. So for us as salespeople, you've got to be somebody that can fix, fill that gap for them. They're trying to find somebody. People like go to the Bible, go as far back into history as you want. Leaders and decision makers always surrounded themselves with trusted advisors. Why? Because they don't know everything. They know they don't know everything and they prefer not to be surprised. They don't like good surprises and they don't like bad surprises. They want to know because they're in charge of the whole operation and they have to make sure that they drive it forward. So that, that's just my experience and my view is that they're looking for people who can actually contribute and then they buy from people who can contribute and they avoid people that waste their time. Yeah. So I think the time wasting is interesting The programmatically what I try and do is get in there and try and ignore. I think step one, I think about it, is ignore their self perceived status. And you go, hey, how's it going? Talk a little bit more informally and a little bit faster than they're used to. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, great to see you today. Wow, super busy over here, like really. And by the way, everybody's busy. Unemployment is negative 15%, right? Definitely like a lot of our peers, people are accepting jobs after long negotiations and then just not showing up for the start date because during that time they got two other jobs. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, we're super busy. Assume you are too, right? ignoring all the status cues that the larger company, it's, whether it's Microsoft or a hedge fund or Oracle or just a large customer, and just saying, hey, I'm trying to get to somewhere as fast as possible, we're super busy. It looks like you've got this problem about as bad as you can get it. And so it's ticking time bomb to the point that we would even want to work on it. And to me, those are status cues that even if you just started, even if you're just 19 years old, you can deploy immediately and get at the same level of any of anybody that you're talking to. So agree or disagree with that? I agree. I think that it's important that you establish that you're there to create value for them. And I think that the more, like what I see people do is spend way too much time and work way too hard to develop rapport. And, and they don't understand that the rapport with somebody who's making decisions is what do you have to offer are you a peer or not so once you don't present that they know already where they are with you if you're planning to become a deal maker at this level make sure to join the daily deal maker we get into one little piece of this daily and so you're just stacking and stacking and stacking these tools and tactics and strategies until they come out of you as naturally as they come out of me and the people that I work with. Add the tips, tools, strategies, tactics a little bit every day. And by the end of a year, you'll be a totally different, new, improved person. 
and a very strong deal maker. Thank you.